Okay. My name is Stephanie Owitz. I know most of you by now. Um, as some of you I've never met, but I think we're starting to feel like we're getting to know each other because we're meeting like this. And this is the next best thing. I'm so sorry we can't meet in person, but um, at least we can do this. I am the director of the Levis JCC Sandler Center, and I do the adult programming uh, throughout the season. And unfortunately, we can't meet in person, but we've quickly figured out how to do this, and thank goodness for that. Today's book, as you're all aware, is The Yellow House by Sarah Broom. Um, before we start our discussion, I will share with you a brief video just to get us um, to get us going. Uh, actually, I have two brief videos. I think I'll do one now and one at the end. Now, Jeffrey Brown has another title for the NewsHour bookshelf. Leslie Author Good. Sarah Broom's yeah. memoir, The Yellow House, won the 2019 National Book Award for Nonfiction. Jeff began by asking Broom about the owner of the Yellow House, her mother, Ivory May. She went on to raise me and my 11 siblings in this house. So beyond it being my mother's place, it's a significant place emotionally for all of us. It's a personal memoir you've written, but it, interesting, you didn't you didn't show up until around page 100. Oh, that's true. You're telling a much larger story about not only your family, but this particular area of the city. That's true, and it felt completely natural to me to not show up for 100 pages. I tried it the other way. I tried beginning the story with me, but something about that felt like it lacked context. And I really wanted to make this world that existed in context. And I wanted to talk about my grandmother and how she made houses, how she was obsessed with making place and how she passed that quality on to my mother mm -hmm. and how my mother passed it on to me. Mm -hmm. So that ultimately when this house is gone, what we feel is so much more, more intense, right? Because it's not just a house or you really understand what made this place. My mother, Ivory May, bought the Yellow House in 1961 when she was 19 years old. It was her first and only house. Within its walls, my mother made her world. Well, I really wanted to think about what it means, not just, so not just for the person who doesn't know New Orleans or isn't from a place, but for the person who really knows a place to get very up close to something and tell that story, but also think about and figure in what distance does, what it means, for instance, if the story of New Orleans becomes for someone only Katrina, and they only see that story or those images from 200 miles away, right? How that changes their relationship to a place. So I wanted to go very high up and, and present that view, but then also say, look what you're missing. You're missing this 19 year old who bought this house. You're missing my brother Carl, who goes there every single day after his job at NASA and tends to land. And then also to, to think about the, the innate taboo for me of being the baby of 12 children telling this story. That felt painful to do. And it, it was something I had to reckon with the entire time I was writing. How dare I tell this story? It's not my story to tell. And I'm telling too much. And you told this or you figured your way in to tell mm -hmm. it through memories, through archival, sure. through, I mean, there's clearly a lot of research, but you also interviewed family members and went as far back as you could? I did. The, the foundation was a year in 2011 when I moved to New Orleans and actually lived moved in the French Quarter, moved back to yeah. New Orleans and lived in the French Quarter on the busiest corner in all of New Orleans. And during that year, I interviewed every single one of my siblings. I recorded them. So I gained from that year hundreds of hours of audio interviews, which I then transcribed. So those make the basis for the book. They're a kind of oral history. But then layered on top of that is are hours and hours I spent driving to various Louisiana towns, driving to cemeteries to get information, going to archives, going to the local library, the Louisiana collection, you know, interviewing people, trying to interview people, and then reading everything I can because there were no books about New Orleans East. 
it's just not that sexy compared to the rest of New Orleans. Did you feel compelled to to correct that record in a sense? Uh, I mean, Katrina plays a role because Katrina right. is what ended up destroying of the course. Yellow House, right? Of course. Katrina got so much attention. Other parts of New Orleans got so much of attention. Mm -hmm. I felt moved and buoyed by the idea that I could write something that didn't exist. And that, you know, there's a little girl right now still living on the short end of the street in New Orleans East where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it for her so that there could be some history already in existence. And, you know, one of the striking things about New Orleans East is, is the way in which it doesn't always appear on a map of New Orleans. So I wanted to quite literally put New Orleans East on the map. Mm -hmm. In this act of looking back, right, did it make sense? I mean, did, do you see from there, from then to now, for yourself? I think I actually grew up with this feeling of being bifurcated as part of the way I thought about the world. I thought a lot about how our street was cut off from the other end of itself, how New Orleans East was cut off by the Industrial Canal from the rest of the city. I, I think it, it grew me into a person who noticed bifurcations, who noticed disparities, who cared a lot about the ways in which injustice was baked into the soil of a place. You know, one of the things that intrigued me as a kid was how soft the ground was. And of course, when I was a child playing hide and go seek, I didn't understand that the ground was subsiding. Right. But I just knew, and my friends knew, that this is soft ground. It eats our basketballs, or it, when it rains, the water pools right. for one week or two weeks, right? And so to sort of have been born out of this place where we were really thinking about environmental issues even then, but not knowing what to call them. So, so much of, I feel, my composition and how I, how I write and how I think as a human is based on having come from that very specific place. Who did you come to feel you were writing this book for? For my nieces and nephews, I'd say. Younger generation. Primarily, yes. Yeah. And the entire moment now, now that the book exists in the world and even the National Book Award win, is really for them. I mean, they, many of them never heard of the National Book Award before this moment. And so to get the text from them, screenshots of them watching the National Book Award is profound for me. I feel like it's, it's a step toward making them better readers even. And that makes me hugely proud. All right. The book is The Yellow House. Sarah Bloom, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, I wanted to start with that because I think it's marvelous to get a little bit of context about the author and see what she's like and different, different than you might have imagined from reading the book. Um, and I, I always love to hear the author speak. So we'll end with a little video by her as well. A couple of people asked me why I chose this book. And one reason was that I saw that it had won the National Book Award for Nonfiction for 2019, which is quite a compliment. It was also listed on Obama's, uh, Barack Obama's list of favorite books of 2019. Um, and so now I had heard of it in two places. And then I heard an interview with her on National Public Radio that really grabbed my attention. So three strikes, and that's why I chose the book. And it was in my Kindle for a long time before we got to it. I'm glad we finally did. Um, I think that little seven minute interview raises a lot of the themes that we'll be discussing in this meeting today. But she starts the book, and she's talked about it in the little, this little clip, about putting it on the map, putting New Orleans, East New Orleans on the map, a place that nobody talks about. Everybody knows iconic Bourbon Street and the French Quarter and the mythology of New Orleans. And she wanted to tell this story, which is her story, a true story. And somebody else asked me, you know, is it a biography or is it about a, is it a history? It, it, you know, obviously it's both. It's, it's her story, it's a memoir. Um, but it's also a, a, a historical excavation um, of, um, of the city of New Orleans and her family's history there. 
many generations. And um, it was a real, I thought, a um, like an archaeological dig. She had to find all this information. She was the 11th, she was the, the, the baby child in this family. She had to interview the family to get this information. These weren't all her stories. She came late in the story, page 100, as she said. So I thought that was very interesting and what that was like for her to interview the family. And she had some resistance from the family about telling the story. Um, so that was a challenge in itself. Um, the other image that comes up right at the beginning of the book is this idea of looking down at a place from high up, like a drone flying over and getting that 10,000 foot perspective. And I don't know if you've ever looked at your own home on Google Maps, um, but you can zoom in right down into your swimming pool, or you can zoom out to 10,000 feet and see it just as a tiny little speck in a neighborhood. And I think it, it's, that's an interesting thought about perspective. You know, we all think our own, our own homes or our own childhood, they loom so large in our, in our memory, in our consciousness, but we're really just like little specks in a neighborhood uh, if you go up to a higher perspective. So those are just some of the thoughts that come to my mind uh, about the beginning of the book. There are a lot of people already who want to speak, and I'd love to do that. Um, the difficulty of this format, which we've discussed before, is it's less of a dialogue than we would like it to be when we're in the library. We can really sort of go back and forth, and that doesn't really happen so much in this format. It becomes more like sequential comments. Um, so we want to hear from as many people who, is, who would like to speak. Generally, I tend to stay away from comments like I liked it or I didn't like it because that's not enough information. I want to go a little deeper than that. And would you recommend it and why and how did it impact you even if you didn't like it? Because to me, like and not like is a little like vanilla ice cream and chocolate ice cream. Some do, some don't. You know, it doesn't really, not everybody's going to like everything. So I'd like to know a little bit more about how you how you experienced the book. Leslie, if you'll call on some people, that'd be great. I would love to. We're gonna start with Natalie. Go ahead, Natalie. I need to unmute. We're unmuted. We hear you. Okay, so um, I asked Stephanie um, if I could speak first. I don't ordinarily like, uh, feel great about doing memoir and book clubs because the people's story is the people's story. So I really wanted, because we live in perilous times, to broaden the focus of, of this discussion and the way we look at the book. And I want to tell you two quick stories. One, shortly after Katrina and I was living someplace else, I was with a group of women and I said, it really upsets me that we are pouring money into New Orleans and we're letting a city like Flint die. This was long before Flint water, so a lot of people didn't know Flint. And somebody called me aside later and said, I know you didn't mean it, but it, it really sounded like a racist comment. And I laughed because Flint is a black city and, and one of many. <laughs> um, and the other piece of it is after the um, after Katrina, people were very taken with New Orleans and what happened. My son was working for the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, and one of the things that he did was he took temple groups to New Orleans to um, to work there for a week, and people would come up and say, <clears throat> "This is the most important work I've ever done." I'm, I'm so thrilled that I had this opportunity. This has changed my life. And Mark finally began by telling people, know that when you go home, if this is important to you, wherever you live within 20 minutes, you can do this work. So I wanna say, this is a very particular story, but it really resonates about what is happening in this country in the, in the broad thing. I don't think, I don't think people that a one-off, she's a one-off maybe, because how many people win the National Book Award? Um, but the story, not so much. And, and I'd like to hear what other people think about the book in general. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Leslie, you wanna 
And thank you, Stephanie, for coming. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, no, I think Natalie raises important points. And, you know, I, as I was reading the book, I thought about that, you know, when you visit certain cities as a tourist, you only see the, the, the part, you know, that you're supposed to see, unless you wander off the beaten path and you wander down some side streets and alleyways and whatever, you can, you know, just, to, I'm thinking of Las Vegas, you know, for example, there, you know, the, 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 the strip, with with uh, all the the glitz and the glamour, um, and then two blocks away, there's you know complete poverty and um, and the people and many of the people who work in these places can't even afford to live anywhere uh, nearby. Um, and she she spoke about that in New Orleans when she goes back to live in New Orleans. You know how expensive it is um, um, compared to uh, you know where she had grown up. Um, so yeah, so I think that there are many, many cities that we, we only see what we're supposed to see, and then the rest of the life exists uh, a couple of blocks away. Um, go ahead, Leslie. Before we go on, we've had a few comments in the chats asking people to oh. turn fans and make sure their cameras are on the screen and not on the roof. Okay, so yeah, that's always a good reminder. Please know that we can see you. And if, you're cam if your camera is facing the ceiling, all we're seeing is your ceiling fan and it's distracting. Just let's, let's see your face, um, tip your camera so it shows you. Mm -hmm. And also if you're going to get up and move around, please leave the phone or the iPad where it is because we get dizzy if we have to follow you around the house. Thank you. Okay, great. We're going to Sarah. Thank you. Um, I thought it was so interesting, the Jeffrey Brown interview, and I'm so glad you did that because I like him a lot. But do you, I mean, she was wearing a yellow shirt, yellow gold shirt, and I just couldn't get over thinking about it. In reading the book, I couldn't help think about some of the characters. Some of her brothers and sisters were less memorable than others, but the two, of course, Carl stands out because of course he was still goes back. But Michael, the chef who wore his pressed clothes and how immaculate he was, who went to work in restaurants, for me was very memorable. But what really struck me about Michael was the fact how brilliant he was, that he scored off the chart in his records. And yet when he went to another school, his records were lost. So what I take away from that is how many brilliant, wonderful people we don't recognize. They're either, for one reason or another, their, their um, attributes or their success is not a memory that we have. Not just the National Book Award winners, but her siblings and the people she grew up with. And then I had to be left also with the fact that how many people we lost in the Holocaust who would have been Pulitzer Prize winners, Peace winners, Book Award winners, all of these incredible people that we lost that we just failed to recognize. And, and one other comment. For me, this book was, the, the, the language of it didn't sweep me away like unearthly or briefly gorgeous. The language in that book was something I think I will never forget. But Sarah Broom did have quite a few memorable phrases that I think, I think we'll talk about as a group. But one of them that also struck me, water is a perfect memory for, um, for what is she, forever, forever bringing us back to our roots. I'm sorry if I didn't quote that correctly. But I thought that was wonderful because water, the water is such an important metaphor all through the book. Yeah, water. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about the water and even referring to it as the water, um, I thought was interesting. You know, we, first we experienced Betsy with her and then um, and Hurricane Betsy and then Katrina. And there are a lot of quotes about water. And, um, and I, I also thought those were quite memorable. Um, here's one. Uh, shame is slow creeping. The most powerful things are the quietest, if you think about it, like water. Um, and th that was just one. And of course, shame is another theme that comes up throughout the book, which I'm sure we'll discuss. Leslie. Tina, go ahead. I was 
the, the book touched me, but I found it very, very, very difficult to read. There were so many details that it, it, it put me off. I just could only read for a certain amount of time. I became confused with all the different characters and she did not, you know, she went back and forth and back and forth. I found it a, an extremely difficult read. I think it was much too long. Um, she did give tremendous insight into what uh, a poverty area was like. I mean, we just have to go down Dixie Highway from Miami all the way up and you can see poverty just rampant. But um, I just thought it was a little too much. It was much too long for me anyway. Um, Susan? Um, hi. I think a lot of good points were brought up here. Um, I, I, I was thinking about what is a home? Um, um, the first thing that struck me was I thought about the Dutch house and how that, that um, was such an important thing. But this was important in a totally different way. Um, the, the, the house was such a, a central point in this house. Um, in a way, this family was living, I'm going to put it in quotes, a lie. Um, the mother uh, kept them looking so beautiful. She made all their clothes. She made curtains for the house. She tried to make the inside of the house as best, best as she could. So people thought this family was really doing better than they were. Um, talked, you mentioned uh, shameful as a theme. These children could not invite anybody into the house. The mother said, I don't recall exactly how she put it, but this was not the kind of home that you invited people to. Um, I was also uh, um, struck by how, how this, the family stuck together. What a loving family loving family and a close family that it was, even when they were scattered. One of the things I did wonder about, the mom was a nurse's aide. She did get a degree later on in sewing, I believe. But I wonder how they supported themselves, just for the basics, even though the children did help on, out later on. But I just wondered about that. That's all I'm going to say now, because I'm sure people will bring up other things. I enjoyed the book. Yes, it was very difficult to get into, but once I got into, I thought it, there were just so many things which I'm not gonna bring up now. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, one of, the, one of the things I've sort of taught myself to do when I have difficulty getting into a book at the beginning, especially if there are a lot of characters, I decide it's not so important to remember who everybody is and who, how they're related to one another and who's the uncle and who's the aunt. It doesn't really matter. I just keep reading and eventually it comes together and, or sometimes I make a few notes and sort of make myself a little family tree, but it's not necessary, I find. You know, it's even if you're reading, you know, the, I remember as a, as a teenager reading the big Russian, you know, Anna Karenina and whatever, and there are 10,000 characters and it's impossible to keep track of them. And if you get focused, stuck on the details like that, you miss the big picture. So I find I just keep going. Just keep going and eventually it comes together. Leslie. Thank you, Yvette. Um, yes, thank you for showing us that YouTube interview because I started out the same way Dina did. There were too many names. I started writing it down with a phrase or two and then I said, this is ridiculous, I'll never finish the book. But when she said, that she didn't come into the book herself for a hundred pages, I realized that was the turning point for me because I ended up liking the book very much. It was a hard read. There's no question about that. But I, she was wonderful and it was, it was very interesting to hear about Katrina from the victims of Katrina and all the changes that made in their lives. And, and to, to get to know a black family who was so loving and so caring of each other. 
I thought that was just beautiful. I joined Black Lives Matter and I really didn't know a whole, whole lot about this and, and just seeing this one family and how close and caring they were was just beautiful. And I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, I think that again, that relates to the theme of, you know, the, the things that are hidden that we don't see or that we selectively see. And I think that's a theme that comes throughout the book. She even talks about her own eyesight being a problem as a child and, and then she gets glasses finally and suddenly she sees clearly and then when she doesn't want to see she takes her glasses off um you know and i think that that's you know very literal seeing not seeing but it's also a metaphor for uh, the selective seeing that we all do and so these hidden families these people this is not this is this is this is one family story you know that this, this is not a unique story it's just that we haven't seen it it hasn't been told to us we haven't paid attention um and it's about selective seeing, um, selective vision. Yeah. Barbara? Hi, good morning. Mm -hmm. I, I love the book. It was hard to get into. And for a while I said, <clears throat> it's just dragging. But I love the city of New Orleans. I spent quite a bit of time there. My kids went to school there. In fact, my son and daughter-in-law met there. And I loved it so much, I found every excuse I could to go visit him. I had to bring him clothes. I had to bring him food, all kinds of things. <laughs> I had a lot of fun there. And I also did conventions there from business. So, and I got to meet people who lived there. I was not aware of all the time, the five years that I went there, I was not aware of this East New Orleans area. And I was all over New Orleans. I ate in every restaurant that's there. I remember when they mentioned Ruth Chris across the bridge. That was, I, I was there, but I don't remember this, this other area. But there is a lot of blight there in New Orleans. And it is, there's a lot of um, uh, you know, bad things that are happening. But I think the most important thing that came out, it doesn't matter the, the money that they had, it matters the sense of family that she was able to develop with minimal, um, minimal material things, because even at the end, the land itself, the place where the house was, the things in the neighborhood were important to them. And that is really a very rare quality today, this, this attachment to family and how they kept in touch with each other all these years. I think it's also a shame the way the, um, the money and the government treated the area they knew that it was below sea level and they knew that there were problems there, but they went ahead and they built the, and they built there and they built buildings and they built un, un, poor quality things and they didn't take care of the people. And when they tore it down, they really did not find other places for them. A lot of the people were left in the lurch. And I think that's a terrible way that government uh, has, has acted there. And, uh, I was there. I haven't been there since Katrina, but um, there, there was a lot of very bad areas. In fact, one of the apartments my kids had was in a, one of those very bad areas. But yet, everybody lived there and everybody stayed. So it was amazing. But I, but I loved the book. I loved the story, and I liked mm -hmm. that family that they developed. And it didn't matter what they had in the house. But she trained them to search for more and for better, and to stay together. And I thought that, look, she, from that area, she went to college and got a, a, a degree and won awards. So there had to be something there that motivated her. It wasn't just ability. And for the other people, to, for the other family members too. I thought it really was a great family um, example of what you can do. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, one of the themes that what you're talking about reminded me of that I wanted to bring up was this this theme of facades. Um, you know that, that 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 we talked about it a little bit before. The house appeared better on the outside than it was on the inside. The window coverings covered what was going on inside, and inside was a lot of uh, d uh, decay and disrepair, and uh, things were falling apart all the time. Um, but nonetheless, it was still a home. Um, but she also, the theme of facades ap appears later when she's talking about working for uh, Mr. Mayor, M Mr. Mayor uh, Ray Nagin, 
um, who she had to call Mr. Mayor, <laughs> um, you know, and the billboards they were putting up all over the city about how great things were and the reconstruction and the rebuilding. <laughs> and Isn't it wonderful what we're doing for you and 6,000 potholes filled and blah, 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 you know, and it was a facade and she couldn't work. She couldn't continue. Um, she left after six months of writing beautiful speeches for him that were really just a cover up for the mismanagement and disorganization, a, a lot like what was going on in the house. Um, I felt that that was interesting that she found herself in that situation and couldn't, couldn't bear it um, and couldn't stay because now she was not using her selective vision. She was seeing it for what it was. Okay, Leslie. Andrea? Hi. <clears throat> well, I did like the book. I too felt it was a little long but for me, it brought back um, lots of memories. And so, um, uh, of just um, my, my first house growing up from when I was four years old till uh, 12 years old and the neighborhood that I was in and the friendships with people like her friendship with Alvin. And um, my mom passed away like six months ago and um, during the last few months of her life, we, because she had dementia, we talked a lot about the past. And so we talked a lot about, you know, the old neighborhood and the house. And I remember it had like this huge picture window in the living room. And um, <clears throat> since um, my mom passed away, I have reconnected with three neighbors from that old neighborhood, um, three women that are my age, and we now live in different places. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll get off in a second to you and hear the dog bark. And, um, and it's really been fun to reconnect and tell stories of the old neighborhood. And our houses were all the same. They were identical homes and we were semi-detached. And just to talk about, um, the different things we, we, we did in our homes and where the kitchen was and and where the, the, the bathroom was that like looked out to the front yard. It was just brought back a lot of really wonderful memories for me and that's what the book did for me. <laughs> Sorry about the dog. It's okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, Marsha? Yeah, hi. Um, so, I haven't finished the book yet, and I, I wasn't going to come in into this because I, I haven't finished the book yet. And then, as usual, when I, I do that and I just listen to everybody, it either convinces me to continue reading or like, well, you know, from what I've heard so far, I, I think I won't bother. And, and I've had to push through because not a lot, quote unquote, happens, moves the story forward. And I found something interesting that um, I began when, particularly when the character Joseph was, was talking uh, about things, the speech patterns are unfamiliar to us in general. There's, um, I, I felt like I do when, when I've gone to another country or when, when I was 19 and I lived on a kibbutz in Israel for a while and there were people from all over the world there and there was a group of guys who came from Argentina and they spoke English and I understood a little bit of Spanish, but once you know the group of us were hanging out, they, they would try to speak English for those of us who couldn't understand Spanish, but after a while, they just lapsed into speaking Spanish because that was what they were comfortable with. And I would sit there and have no idea what they were saying, but I loved the rhythm of the language. And every now and then someone would turn to me like and translate something. But for, for part of the time, I, I couldn't understand the language. And I felt the same with this book, like I was being lulled by the rhythm of the language. And, and, and I was able to, um, you know, particularly in these times when, when we talk about understanding each other through, in the, len through the lens of, of the racial disparities, that I felt like this was a way of getting to know what it was like to grow up with, with them 
without ever being able to experience it. So, um, and, and thank you um, for, for talking about the themes. I mean, that theme of, of selective vision. If for nothing else, I will continue to read the book just to see that play out. And I feel like going forward now, when I'm reading it, I have the, ad, the, the added benefit of being able to look for what's illustrating some of these these themes because I think good the themes yeah are because bad. this isn't the kind of a book where there are spoilers that are going to ruin it for you there's no big twist Exa oh no exactly twist at the end that we're going to give away right um, there's a hurricane they survive uh, <laughs> right. the, house, the house does not survive they survive okay right. um uh oh I just lost my thought Oh, um, she talks, uh, the, the, you know, the, the dialogue is written very much, where well, the dialogue with the family is written very much in the way that they speak, in the dialect, as you, you know, the, and, and I think some people might have found some of that a little difficult to read because it is a little bit foreign, but it, I thought it was very, very interesting that she was, you know, the narrative is written as Sarah, the educated um, literate person that she is and the dialogue is written the way the family speaks and it brings up this idea that we talked about when we read the hate you give this idea of code switching this fact this duality of living in two worlds um and when she's with her brothers and her family she's monique you know and when she's in the uh professional world or the academic world she's sarah and those are two different personas that exist within her um, and then she has to move back and forth between them. But I think that's not so uncommon. I think we all have different personas uh, that we use in different situations. Um, but I think it's really um, highlighted in the, in the, when the mainstream culture doesn't um, value the, the minority culture, you really have to live in both worlds and you really switch on and switch off. Whereas I'm pretty much the same person whether I'm here talking to you or talking to my family, there are some differences, of course, but the, it, but I'm not living in two worlds. Um, so I think that was an interesting perspective. You know, with her brothers, she was really Monique. And at one point, one of her brothers said, you know, it implied sort of that she had moved on from them. Uh, she, she, was, she was too good for them. Um, she never felt that she was, but that was the danger for her in expanding her world was leaving the other world behind and being perceived as having left it behind. Not something I had to face when I went to college or most of us had to face, that somehow I was abandoning my roots by going to get educated. Um, you have some hands up, good, Leslie. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I was just going to say something about that. Um, yes, even though her mom put her in private school, it obviously wasn't a very good one because when she went to college, she had to take remedial classes first. She was not up to speed. And I also found it interesting, um, even though she applied to college, she didn't know about many schools. She only knew about one that was in her area and she probably could have gotten into other schools. She also always kept returning to New Orleans, she did not want to abandon her roots. It was very important for her and to um, be able to be part of her family. She did not want to uh, leave that sector really. And even um, later on in life, I also watched every video that there was, um, she still has a place somewhere halfway between where she grew up and um, the French Quarter, as well as living in Harlem. So um, I can see that she did, uh, she still has two um, patterns of speech. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Elaine? Yes, good morning. Um, I just wanted to address the um, <clears throat> comment you made about her seeing from a distance and taking her glasses off when she didn't want to see clearly. I just thought it was fantastic after hearing her speak, of course, how she started the book from up, up high and came down like she was bringing us into a microscope 
so we could then see the little nits and grits of her life from a, starting from afar and coming down and opening up like you would do when you're looking at something through a microscope. And uh, <clears throat> that's, of course, started the book for me, but hearing all these themes and whatever really brings the book, gives it more life and um, makes it more important. And as an aside, I don't know if it's still available, but maybe five years ago, I saw an ad in the New York Times for an aerial view of your home made into a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was living in Colorado in, on a mountain surrounded by forest. So I ordered it for the family because the kids used to come out all the time and we would keep it out on a table. And when she opened up the book, that's what I could think of is like, we lived in this beautiful home, but we didn't know what was around us. And now I have a different perspective of that in my life because of the way she started the book. I just thought it was really very good. But anyway, it's it might still be available if anyone's interested. <laughs> I, I ordered it, I sent, had to send a, uh, my address and then they went by their, I guess, their, I don't know what they did, the satellite photos of, uh, of that address and they turned it into a, a jigsaw puzzle. Just as an aside, <laughs> yeah. that's it. Just as an aside, it's really interesting to go to Google Maps and, and put in your address and zoom in and zoom out. Yeah, that's what it's like, experience. except it's now a puzzle and we have to try to put it exactly. together. Right. And that's what she did. And to me, it was like she was putting this puzzle together exactly. to re redevelop her home. Thank you. Uh, Sheila? Uh, yes, I haven't finished the book yet. Uh, I'm finding the details very uh, wonderful and delicious, and I'm taking my time with it. Oh, that's my finger in the way. And I I'm very struck by the courage and the excellence of so many of the characters and the drama and the challenges, everyday challenges. I was very struck with the, uh, at the very beginning, how the grandmother and Ivory and they had every meal had to be meticulously prepared. Nothing less than perfection was acceptable. Do you remember that? Everything had to be minced and very carefully prepared. And they took pride in whatever they had. They tried to make the most of that, particularly at the beginning of the book. And you could see uh, uh, after uh, Sarah was born, they were just worn down. <laughs> Everybody was just worn down. I was extremely struck with the danger of the highway right in the middle of their life. And the yeah. young children had to cross the highway just in order to get to school. Yeah. And the child who was dragged by the truck and just all, just all the very, very challenging uh, incidents and uh, 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 you know, the fact that some of the siblings were so much older. And I got a very big kick out of the, uh, as a, an inner city teacher for 30 years, I got uh, a big kick out of uh, the author's uh, exploration of her, uh, her naughtiness and her friskiness and her challenges. And she was, you know, and before, we thought that maybe the, the eyeglasses would uh, would correct it but you know she had a lot of um, she was acting out a lot in many many occasions and I, I enjoyed the book tremendously I'm not finished yet but I'm enjoying it tremendously yeah thank you um, I highlighted a few quotes that that were important to me um, and here's one I had no home this is after Katrina mine had fallen all the way down I understood then that the place I never wanted to claim had in fact been containing me. We own what belongs to us, whether we claim it or not. When the house fell down, it can be said, something in me opened up. Um, I thought that was a very important uh, quote there um, about you know, how, where we come from is inside of us, whether we claim it or not, whether we want it or not, whether we're embarrassed by it or not, 
we take it with us inside of us. The house contained her, she contained the house. Um, I thought that was interesting. Um, I have more um, video if you'd like. I see nobody else has a hand up right now. Is there anyone who wants to make a comment right now? No, then I'm going to share the other video. It's I think quick. maybe Trudy does. Trudy, do you oh, want Trudy? to talk? Trudy, did you want to say something? Unmute yourself, Trudy. Press unmute, Trudy. I am, am I? Okay. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. I, I was thinking just almost what you said, Stephanie. Houses have personality, and somehow how you relate to your house as a child makes a big difference how you feel. The idea that there are uh, uh, not a home you invite people to can make you feel as a child very uncomfortable uh, if, you, you know, your friendships are thwarted and all. So the idea of like, say, uh, being comfortable in your skin, it's, you, you could also say being comfortable in your house. A house has a personality and whether we know it or not, it certainly with me, affected me a great deal because my mother's home was always open and all. And I can imagine if you're embarrassed, it can't be people into your home, what it can do to your personality. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, so the history of a house, which was one uh, subject I studied, I learned more from this book than I did from the course that I took in school. Houses have personality and how you relate to them. So thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Okay, we have some more hands. Louise, go ahead, unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I just said interesting about her job. Nobody's mentioned that. She about what? A, her work life, her jobs. Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't, okay. Um, she seemed to always fall into something and it was often with the same central theme of writing or whatever, but so diverse. And every job took a different skill set. And I found that interesting that she moved from New York to New Orleans to Africa. Um, and she always came up with a job and, and seemed to know the people or somehow step into it. That's all I have to comment because I'm not sure how she really managed that. Well, she's obviously extremely talented. She's very bright, mm -hmm. very good communicator. Um, uh, you know, I think that, that she has some real innate talents. And we've talked about this sometimes in some of the other books, you know, it, 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 it helps to be given some God-given talents to start That's with. It. But then you need opportunities and you need That's to- the able, part. And then you need to be able to recognize opportunities when, as opportunities, you know, and that, that's a talent in itself. Um, and then sometimes one good thing leads to another good thing, like working at Oprah Magazine had to open a lot of doors for her. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. Sarah? Um, I also underlined the exact same quote about houses that Stephanie did. And she said, um, houses provide a frame that bears us up without the structure. We are the house that bears itself up. I was now the house. And she also said, remembering hurts and forgetting is Herculean. And I thought that was really great language. The, her time in Burundi, I thought was also fascinating. It reminded me of the same thing where you look, go Google Maps 30,000 or 15,000, but then when you drill down into it, you find the underneath, you find the real truth. Like she found that she really wasn't as helpful and successful and mission fulfilled in Burundi as she wanted to be. The same thing as working in Mayor Nagan's office. She found the reality. And uh, I thought that was also well done too. Also the whole thing about vision and seeing what life is like with glasses versus without glasses. I thought that was all. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to go to the video in a second, but one more quote about water. Um, water, water has a perfect memory, Toni Morrison has said, and it's forever trying to get back to where it was. Um, I thought her, her, her quotes throughout the book um, were terrific. And, um, you know, she's obviously extremely well read as well. Um, but, but water, um, you know, water is, it, 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 it can be very placid and beautiful and it can be so destructive. And um, that duality again. Um, I also love the imagery of the soft ground that was always sort of threatening to suck you in. The image of quicksand. You know, when, I, when we were kids, uh, I remember the cartoons with quicksand, you know, and it's like quicksand doesn't really, I don't think hardly exist, but in the cartoons, it was a very big threat, right? The ground could just suck you in. Um, and she's describing, she's describing that, um, this soggy ground that's always ready to open up and suck you in. Okay, let me go to, oh wait, Susan has her hand up and then I'm gonna share my screen. Go ahead, Susan, and unmute yourself. I, I have, there you go. Just one last um, image. I mm. think it was, was it Carl who set up that table on the ground where the house was before it was raised? Yes. And, and they all would congregate around that table I mean, even the property had meaning to them, that they couldn't abandon the property. Sort of holding the place, keeping that's, the place. That's right. It had so much meaning. And I just have one thing I, I want to say. I think you're going to show the video where she talks about the award that she won. Actually right? not. Actually nope. not. It's a Good Morning America video, but do you want to say okay. something about that? There's a ton of good video. And I, do I, recommend wait a I cried when I watched that one, how yeah. she thanked every sibling, yes. her mother, and how several of them were in the audience. I literally yeah. cried. Was it, she's wearing a red dress, and she, yes. this is when she was and get, she, receiving the National Book Award. And she speaks so beautifully. I think everybody should watch that well, one. Well, if we have time, I'll get to that, too. They're both these are both brief, but there's a very wonderful interview with her, um, the Nantucket Book Festival. If you Google Sarah Broom Nantucket Book Festival, it's about an hour long. It's a fantastic interview um, if you have the time for it. It's really worth doing. Um, but right now, I'm just going to go to another short one. Let me see if I can find it. It's not that one. Hang on. Um, it's this one. Am I on your screen, Leslie? Yes. Okay. Author Sarah M. Broom, whose new memoir, The Yellow House, takes us on a journey, and a remarkable journey, through New Orleans, especially New Orleans East, exploring her beloved childhood home that was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. Her tale is one of love, loss, and resilience. She's going to join us in a moment. Let's take a look at her story first. The yellow house was witness to our lives. When it fell down, something in me burst. After Sarah Broom's childhood home was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, she was inspired to rebuild in a different way. How to resurrect a house with words. This is Sarah's mission in her new book, The Yellow House. Sarah grew up in New Orleans East, just seven miles outside of the French Quarter. New Orleans East is not a place you find on most of the tourist maps. Today, Sarah is reclaiming the narrative of her city and her home. Houses provide a frame that bears us up. Without that physical structure, we are the house that bears itself up. I was now the house. Such profound words. Please welcome Sarah. <laughs> dinner in her home in Harlem several months ago. She said, you know, I've written this little book. I'm like, oh, well, send me an advance copy. I read it. I'm like, oh, amazed by it. And then boom, but it took eight years, eight years. Oh, yes. It was a labor of love, wasn't it? It really was. And it was important for me to get it right, Robin. Mm. Uh, this was a place my mother bought when she was 19 years old in 1961 with every cent she had. 
And so I had to do justice to the world that she built. You know, I'm the baby of 12 children. 12, <laughs> I know, right? So she raised 12 human beings inside of this house. And when I was growing up, there were no stories of New Orleans East. Even when I was reporting this book, there weren't reference books. I wrote the book that I needed and that I wanted my nieces and nephews to read. You have like 50 of them, don't you? I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly 50 oh, of them. Right, right, right. I hope that they'll add to the story. That's it right. Really inspires families. And I'm inspired now to learn more about my family history. And, you know, when you hear, yes, there's no place like home. And it's the details. You know, a house mm. is a house, but what makes it a home to you? You know, for me, it's beauty. That's the thing my mother taught me, is that you figure out what's beautiful for you, and then you go out and you collect beauty. Mm. That no matter what you have, we can all train our eyes upon a beautiful thing and get immense joy from it. And so for me and where I live, I'm always collecting beautiful things. Mm. Uh, and even if they don't match or they don't go. I, I didn't want to say that, but when I was in your home, I was like, that doesn't go. With that. It, was, it, was, it was so warm and inviting. It was you, it's you, it's you. Sure. Okay, it's August. And those of us who are from down south, and we have some folks in Mississippi and New Orleans, 14 years ago, Hurricane Katrina. And your home was destroyed by that. And then later was completely completely demolished by the city. You recently were able to go back. When you went back and just saw that lot, what was in your mind and your heart when you saw that? You know, Robin, it was a profound feeling. When I went back, the only thing left that I could recognize was a single cedar tree that my father had planted before I was born. The rest yeah. of the lot was just green grass growing. And I thought to myself, it was the first moment I understood why I wrote this book, because I thought, oh, this book tells the history of a place no one except me or my siblings can see. Mm -hmm. And so for the kid who still lives on the street where I grew up, she will have a record, a history of what came before. Yeah. But what is your message? What does you want, what people reading this, what do you want them to have? the message to come away with. Sure, I think for me, it's really about what, what it means to love a place. That if we truly love a place and are tethered to a place, then it's our job to get to know that place, to think of that place and to look beyond the official mm -hmm. map, to not only go to the places that are in the narrative, but to go beyond those places. Well, well thank you for taking us on. Thank you. <laughs> Um, people outside of the family weren't really in this home. They weren't really, well, not, I wouldn't say not welcome to the home, but they weren't able to come into the home. But you take us on this extraordinary journey, and you are an engaging guide. So thank you for thank that. You. And the Yellow House is out now. Wait, audience, you're going home with a copy. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get back to... Okay, yep. we have a couple of hands up. Hold on. Um, Alice, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good morning. Thank Hi. you. So, thank you so much. Stephanie, what a wonderful job you did, and everybody with all your comments. And Alice, Stephanie. get a little closer to your microphone. I'm sorry, and I tried to fix it this morning, and I can't It's okay. It Just get closer to it. Is that better? A little bit. Sorry about that. Thank you. You did a great job, Steph. And everybody's comments meant so much. I do. And you know what? I think this is about a poor family in that part of New Orleans. But I could relate a lot to what you said. There were times I didn't want people in my house. There were times my mother didn't let people know how poor we were because she wasn't brought up that way. And I think a lot of people can, can relate to that. I found that interesting, especially Trudy brought that home and some of your quotes. The one thing when I think about it, this 19-year-old woman bought this house, right? But she let that second husband mess it up. It wasn't mm -hmm. so much the emotional things that were going on. It was the physical things. Isn't that interesting? Mm hmm You know, and I don't think it was his intention to mess it up. He was trying to expand and improve, and, but he just couldn't finish anything he started, apparently. 
and then he died. Right, suddenly, yep. Um, okay, we have a couple more hands up. I just wanted to make one comment. She brought up the issue of the, the letter about the demolition of the house. I thought it was very profound that they send a, a letter to a house that's been abandoned to tell you that it's going to be torn down. The callousness of the bureaucracy, sending a letter, that's the only way we can communicate with you is a letter to a house that's been abandoned, a letter that will never be read. Um, thought that was very interesting. Okay. Uh, yes, I I want to thank you for discussing the book, Steph. It was great. I enjoyed it. But also, what stood out in my mind was uh, Ben Harper. She wrote a, uh, I'll just read it, because she wrote, The house of my father inside it. But his Estelle, Estelle, I'm sorry no to interrupt you. No longer, uh, oh, as long as I have Okay, to, Estelle, Estelle, we're having trouble with your Wi-Fi. We're not hearing you, Estelle. It's, it's, it's your Wi-Fi, okay. I apologize. Let me just right. say that, by the way, when you're doing this, people, it's very good. If, you're, if your Wi-Fi is not very strong, make okay. sure anything else that's connected to the Wi-Fi is turned off. Make sure somebody is not watching a movie in the other room or, you know, using the internet. It'll work much better if you're the only one using the Wi-Fi at the time you're trying to Zoom. Okay, Elaine? Hi, yes. Um, before you leave, I just wanted to mention, while I was reading the book, I kept thinking to myself, I've read another story like this and I just found it. It's called, I, it came out in 2015. If anyone's interested, it's a novel. The author is also black and she was up for many awards for the book. It's called The Turner House. Hmm. The author is Angela Flournoy, F-L-O-U-R-N-O-Y. And it's about, it's a novel. It's about a family of 13 adult siblings who once their mother falls ill, they must decide the fate of their Detroit home that they grew up in. And there's a lot going on, and it was it was a good book. Thank so you. if anybody's interested in another point of view, uh, you know, of the same kind of story, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good. Sheila. And then after Sheila, I'll show that last video. If anyone needs to leave, go ahead. But I'll show you the last video, which is also just a few minutes. Sheila. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I need to uh, revisit the mother because I think the mother has not been given the kudos and the credit and the emphasis. The, it just was astonishing. She was always making curtains. She made the clothing for 13 children and just never gave up. She never gave up. And she, uh, I, just, I just wanted to put the spotlight on her because as a, as a woman's group right. and the times, <laughs> I, it, was, it was very phenomenal. And the inner strength and the courage and the dignity and the quiet dignity uh, in face of all the, the uh, troubles and Absolutely. turmoil. And I think Sarah Broome certainly gave her mother um, the, the uh, attention and, and, uh, that she deserved. And you're gonna see now in this little final clip how much she really appreciated her mother. Um, share screen. Um, yeah, we're good. Here we go. Uh, the magnitude of feeling in this room just reminds me being here of the distance I've come. Uh, standing in front of you here now alone, but accompanied by some who are in this room now and some who are not, some whose names I know to call, others whose names I cannot. In this room, the Grove Atlantic team, led by the indomitable, unstoppable Morgan Intrican. Morgan and his incredible team who believed from the first Jin Ah, who shepherded me safely through. 
Suzanne Gluck, my agent, Michael Takens, Judy Stone, Marie Brown. In this room tonight, my mother, Ivory May, poet in her own right. How, as a child, I watched her every move, seeing her eyes fall upon every word anywhere, encountered in the grocery store, on a bus, pamphlets, the package labels, my high school textbooks. She was always wolfing down words, insatiable, which is how I learned the ways in which words were a kind of sustenance, could be a beautiful relief or a greatest assault, how I learned that words were the best map, make me know, my mother was always saying, in between raising 12 humans. I am in this room, semicolon, and so is my mother. In this room, my big sister Lynette, who left the Yellow House for fashion school in New York City when she was only 19, which then felt like a lurching mission to planet unknown. In this room tonight, my love, Dee Reese, a fellow artist, the most inspired accompaniment of my life. And the chorus, my siblings not here, but whose voices exist in mine, Carl, Michael, Karen, Daryl, Byron, Troy, Eddie, Deborah, Valeria, thank you for telling me the stories in the first place and for trusting me to make something of them, for allowing me to call your names because, because it is no small thing to recover the names. These, there are other names of my family who told me the history of myself, some of whom died before this book was finished and in the world. These absent presences, my auntie Elaine, my mother's only sister, my uncle Joe in January of this year, and in the swiftest blow, my oldest brother, Simon Jr., who died the day after this book appeared in the world. And yet, and somehow and still, in the interstices of time, I have listened a million times to his hesitant voice on the recordings that we made so that I might make this book. His saying, you grew up on Wilson Avenue in the East, baby. You can handle anything. And on the recording, he is also telling me that sometimes I talk too much, which is what I am doing right now. But I just want to say, somehow and still, even with and through it all, the work stands. Nothing can stand in for it, I have learned, because the work is the work is the work. And this honor will buoy me as I make the next one. Thank you. Isn't that beautiful? I loved it. Loved it. And I feel like, you know, between the book and those interviews, we really do know her. And I think she's so beautiful. Um, and I love the rhythm of her speech. Um, she talked in the book about how when she, her mother would make her read from the Bible as, almost as a punishment, but it was a very loose punishment. Uh, she could kind of read it however she wanted and she could play with it and she would play with the verses and the language and and she would read to her mother. And um, I thought that, I think that her love of language um, really came through. So I wanna thank you for a really wonderful discussion, a really meaningful discussion about a good book. We always have good discussions, thank you. And we'll see you in, um, in August for A Long Petal of the Sea by Isabel Allende. Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.